Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of NatChat. I'm Nat Eliason, and as you may or may not know, we're currently exploring what to do as a college student, recent graduate, maybe even high school student, who isn't excited by the traditional college postgraduate career paths. In this episode, I'm joined by Vincent Nguyen. Vincent has a really interesting story because early on into his college career, he knew that that typical path wasn't for him. He started a blog on the side called Self Stairway that was mostly just him exploring how he could do some self-improvement, self-development. And over the course of seven months, he started posting on other publications, making connections with influencers, and eventually got the opportunity to take a apprenticeship with a company called Empire Flippers. This was only his third semester in college, but he decided to drop out, move to the Philippines, take on this opportunity. He started learning marketing with them, and after six months, he was promoted to be their marketing director. After he'd been there for a while, he realized it was time to branch off and do his own thing. So he started his own company, Growth Ninja, where he's helping sites grow their business through Facebook advertising. It was really fun talking to Vincent because he really just recognized early on that traditional path was not for him, started learning things, turned into an awesome opportunity, and he gives some really actionable advice on how people in marketing or not can do the same thing. You could really apply this to any industry that you're excited about. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Vincent Nguyen. Vincent, welcome to the show. I'm excited to have you on today. And I'm excited as well, man. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, so I found you via a friend, Eduardo, who had listened to you on the Tropical MBA podcast. And you were there talking about finding a location independent apprenticeship. And, you know, it's such an interesting topic because it combines things that we've talked about a lot in this podcast, which is that option to travel a lot while working, especially when you're young, even during college. And then also finding these interesting apprenticeships where you get to learn a lot really quickly. So can you tell us a little bit about what that apprenticeship was and how that came about? Yes. Yeah, so back in 2013, I was a full-time college student and I had like three internships I was kind of juggling simultaneously while also running a self-improvement website. So this one day I was just sort of on Twitter when I came across by chance a tweet that basically shared an opportunity that I have didn't even know was out there. Like apparently this was a thing, you know, location independent apprenticeships and, and things like that. And so this was my first time reading about this. And I'm kind of like, this is a little bit too good to be true. And so I'm kind of just scrolling around, researching the company, um, Empire Flippers, and figuring out, okay, are these guys legit? Or are these going to steal my kidneys and, you know, make me work for free in a sweatshop somewhere? And so once I determined that they weren't going to do those things, <laughs> and that they were actually legitimate, I basically applied for it and uh, reached out to a bunch of people that I didn't know really and didn't know me and asked if they could like record a, a little video for me so I could put them all together and just sort of send it over to the guys who were looking for this apprentice to kind of just try to wow them. And so eventually I got the job. I, I dropped out of college um, after three semesters in a community college. And then I obviously left my internships behind. And then I moved out to Southeast Asia, the Philippines specifically, to work with my bosses, Justin and Joe. And I worked as their marketing apprentice for six months, just sort of doing a lot of different things, trying to figure out you know, how to provide the most value to the company. And then became the marketing director, stayed on board as their marketing director for another five or six months, and then eventually left and started my own company, which is uh, actually now approaching our third year pretty soon. So there's like a ton there that we can unpack. What were all of these internships that you were doing when you found Empire Flippers? Yeah. Um, one of them was like a co-working space. I'll be honest, I didn't really do anything. Um, in fact, I don't think they ever actually gave me any task. I was just kind of like doing my own thing while I was there, which was great for me. I mean, hell, I'll put that on my resume, right? And <laughs> and just to hang out. Um, another one was just kind of miscellaneous task for like some random CrossFit gym. I remember they paid me like 150 bucks to put this really simple code on the top of like their menu bar or something. I was like, sweet, that's a lot of money for like a, a 18 or 19 year old at the time. Like I was very happy with that for minimal work. I was like, oh, sweet. I just made 150 bucks in an hour. I'm, <laughs> I'm the man. And then I basically did like small, like miscellaneous things for them again over the course of the uh, next several months. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the third one was. Oh, the third one was um, like an internship for this small local business here in Arizona. And I just did things like 
like really boring stuff that I've never done ever again, like uh, write press releases and just stuff that are pretty outdated. I'm kind of surprised that he had me do the things he did with the knowledge I have now, because like I'm not going to feel what he does or anything because it's pretty easy to find what this what I'm talking about here. But his business, I'm not sure why they were doing press releases. Let's just say that. Yeah, <laughs> it was very old school method for the insider in. Yeah, it's like such an old school thing that a lot of, especially physical businesses, I find still want to do, even though it, I don't know, I, I'm sure you've tried it before too. It's kind of hard to just get a press release picked up anywhere unless you already have the name brand to get written about anyways. Right. Yeah, it's not very high impact for sure. And the amount of time you put into making those, I mean, it's just not worth it. Yeah. And then the main thing that you were working on that helped you land this apprenticeship was Self Stairway, right? Right. Yeah, that was definitely, in my opinion, a very big part of why I got the job outside of the reaching out to influencers and having them make a video for me because it, I think it showed that I had at least some sort of skill and some sort of platform and at least some sort of like motivation. The fact that I was doing this thing every single Monday and it had decent traffic at the time. So it definitely helped. So what was it exactly? So Self Stairway was just this personal development website I started in uh, January of 2013. And so it was just sort of this way for me to just learn how to write, create a writing voice, how to learn internet marketing skills like search engine optimization, conversion rate optimization, and also just a way for me to start making friends with influencers and things like that. People who had audience, people who had the traffic that I wanted to have someday. And so when I was writing, I would be sort of learning as well from the advice or stories I'd be trying to, to tell. And so it was also this tool that allowed me to hopefully become a better person. Now, fast forward to 2017, I'm still pretty bad a human being <laughs> in a lot of ways, but at least I'm not as bad as I was prior to that website. What kind of self-improvement stuff were you focusing on? You know, it was never like, a structured thing. It was more like, what did I feel would have the most impact at the time? And so usually that tied into how was I feeling or what was I doing in my own personal life? And so I try to like tie it to something specific in my own life and use actual life stories as opposed to saying 10 tips on how to be happy. Like that's so vague. It's so overdone. It's so repetitive and like always upbeat with no hints of actual realism in there. And so I just said, here's, you know, the sort of thoughts that are in my head right now. Here's a story that goes with it. And here's the takeaway that I got from it that may or may not be applicable to someone else. Um, again, it's from the perspective of like a 19 year old kid. So I'm sure if I reread some of the older stuff now, I'm kind of like, you know, that wasn't really a big deal. How did I come up with that life story? Uh, that was sort of like a footnote in in a one day. But at the same time, um, I definitely learned a lot through them anyway. And I feel like there's a lot of people who got value. So, you know, it's, it was definitely an interesting point in my life. I don't write on there anymore. I stopped, I think, a year and a half ago. Once I realized I stopped enjoying the process, um, but it was definitely a fun ride. At the time, I never thought I would ever quit it, but now I can't imagine going back to the routine just because I've kind of lost the interest in writing and uh, publishing in general. Where did that interest come from in the beginning? Why did you start it? I think it was because I always knew that just doing something like that, self-stairway, or it could be anything really, but in my case, it was self-stairway, it would lead to something else, something amazing. Like I never knew what it was going to be, of course, because you don't know what you don't know. Um, but eventually, you know, self-stairway led to uh, Empire Flippers. Empire Flippers led to my current business. And so these are all progression steps that relied on the step before it. And so I stuck with self-stairway throughout my time with Empire Flippers, even through, I think, a year and a half or two of my current business. And then I just realized, you know, it served its purpose and I've also lost a spark for it. And so it didn't make sense to force myself to publish every Monday if I didn't want to, or if I felt like I didn't have anything to say or add. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and what was this video that you put together for Empire Flippers? Was that something they asked for? Or was it something that you came up with to make your application stand out? Yeah. So basically in their application, they said, just record a five minute video talking about yourself. And so I said, you know, I'm a 19 year old kid. I don't really have a lot of experience. And so there's no way I could just be like, talking about myself on camera for five minutes and stand out because there can be a lot of other people who are arguably a lot more qualified than I am. So I've got to find a way to really bring this one home. 
And so I reached out to a bunch of people in different spaces, like the internet marketing space, like John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneur on Fire, John Saddington. Um, man, I'm really blanking right now. Neil Patel. And then I also reached out to some people in the personal development space, like Mark and Angel from MarkandAngel.com, Joshua Becker, who's a good friend of mine even to this day. Um, and just kind of had them all record a 10 second or so video just saying I reached out essentially. And then I sort of go in front of the camera. I say, hey, um, my name is Vince Nguyen, yada, yada, yada. Uh, before I talk about myself, I just got something to show you guys. I'll be right back. Very cheesy. I think I even like, quote, unquote, stood up from my chair on camera. And then it cuts to, you know, these videos. And then I, I come back and I talk about myself. And then I end the video with a couple more of those clips. So if anybody wants to check it out, it's on YouTube. Just type in uh, Empire Flippers Vincent, and it should be the first result. Had you already made a connection with these people before you asked them? Or was it a cold email saying like, hey, I'm a kid doing this thing? Yeah, it was basically, I'm a kid doing this thing. I didn't know any of these guys. That's great. <laughs> so I just emailed them. And I was honest. I'm like, look, you don't know me, but like, I have this potentially life-changing opportunity right here. And I have nothing to give you. Like, there's literally nothing I could do for you. And so if you're up for it, you know, here's what you could do. It might mean nothing to you, but it could quite literally change my life. And it did. It literally changed my life. And so, you know, all, a lot of people actually responded. I, I think there was like a 40% response rate or something. Not all those responses said yes, but a good portion of them did. So if I had a guess, I'd say 30 or 25% of people I reached out to actually did the video. And so it was great. In fact, Neil Patel, uh, he was like, this, he is this internet marketing giant, right? And so when I reached out to him, he actually called me and said, dude, this is great. Yeah, tell me what I need to do. And also, by the way, I checked out your blog, you're a great copywriter. I was like, what the hell? Did I just get complimented on copywriting by Neil Patel? And so fast forward a little bit to when I'm thinking about starting my own business, I'm in um, back in the US now, having just done this conference. Uh, in Bangkok with my bosses and stuff. And so I'm having this conversation in San Diego with uh, three other people. And Neil's actually at the table. So I we kept in touch every now and then. And I asked if he was in town. So we all met up for dinner. And at that dinner was where I got the idea for Growth Ninja, my business. And so, you know, it all kind of tied together where if I hadn't had reached out to Neil specifically, who knows if that dinner in San Diego would have happened which means who knows if I would have gotten the idea for Facebook ads as a business. So it just kind of all tied together in a really weird way. So if not for self stairway, never would have led to me reaching out to Neil, which never would have, well, it would never have led to Empire Flippers and then that dinner with Neil and then Growth Ninja. So it's really weird how it worked out. Yeah, it's crazy hearing about those stories where something that you started like a long time ago can lead into something else completely different, like much further down the line, especially with, you know, a few of those just random steps in between. I mean, my first job out of college when I was running marketing for Sumo, I'd gotten that because I'd been doing some content marketing with another company, Zapier. And I had gotten like that sort of internship because I had been writing on my own blog, which had literally just been sort of a, hey, this is kind of fun. I'm just going to put content out there and see what happens, hopefully use it to land some content marketing roles. But it's it's like impossible to connect those dots going forward, right? Mm -hmm. it's, but like right. in looking back, it all kind of makes sense. But it's just sort of that all of those opportunities can pop up and you never know entirely what the thing you're working on is going to lead to. Right. Uh, yeah. It's pretty hard to make like career plans in, uh, in these days. Yeah. My motto is always just kind of wing it. <laughs> that goes for like everything. I mean, it's become a sort of inside joke in the office, actually, which I probably should be careful of because my employees are like, <laughs> oh, very much aware of how much I wing things, <laughs> which isn't probably the greatest impression as a boss. But I mean, it generally works out okay. Well, you just have to hire somebody who's really good at like not winging things, at planning stuff to like balance you out. That's what I've found. Yeah, my employees are pretty good about that. It's just when they ask me for like guidance or help, I'm just like, yeah, honestly, like I would just just do it. <laughs> <laughs> just make it up as you go. You'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, like you'll figure it out. I mean, shit, you're smart. I hire you for a reason. <laughs> so this apprenticeship with Empire Flippers, were they based in the Philippines or did you go to the Philippines to hang out there while you worked for them? Yeah, so they were based in the Philippines at the time. Uh, 
currently I'm, I still keep in touch with them fairly often. In fact, Joe was just in Arizona a month ago and we were hanging out, catching up and stuff. But Joe still lives in the Philippines, in Manila, I believe. And Justin, uh, he was living in Vietnam for a while, but I think he's kind of doing the whole traveling and bouncing around things. So they're, you know, obviously location dependent. Um, Joe, I think, is from New York. Uh, Justin's from California. And so they're, you know, a U.S. company, I think by, uh, you know, structuring LLC or whatever, but they both live in Asia and they just really enjoy Asia and the travel and stuff like that. So they stay out there. And what is the company exactly? What does Empire Flippers do? So what they do is they broker online businesses. And so they serve as the marketplace for buyers and sellers. And so if I wanted to sell my business, you know, I would list it on the marketplace and then they have a large pool of buyers and then they take a percentage of the final sales price. And what were you doing right when that apprenticeship started? Um, so I was kind of doing a lot of stuff. It was um, going back to my model, winging things. There wasn't a lot of structure in the role. And so it was a lot of me just kind of doing a lot of different stuff, seeing what worked. And so I was trying to, you know, get the more leads. Um, so I experimented with Facebook ads a bit during my time there, which is why uh, that conversation came up at that dinner that led to the idea of me starting a Facebook ads company. Um, I also did some content writing, uh, some outreach to people, just kind of a lot of stuff. Uh, some managerial stuff too, like managing a uh, some employees every now and then and stuff like that. So it was a lot of different things. It's really hard to define as one central role because it was during a time where they were going through this tremendous change in their business, going from building businesses for other, or sorry, small websites for other people and selling them off in packages to like becoming this massive marketplace for people to buy and sell established businesses. So it was this crazy transition. And so they didn't really have all the answers for me. I was just trying to figure things out, which I liked because I just like winging things anyway. So it was fantastic. Yeah. Was there much of a marketing team then or were you sort of it supporting the founders? Uh, it was, it was, uh, I mean, I was pretty much it. Um, Justin is a marketer too. And so it was like me and him bouncing ideas off each other at the dining table or whatever. And yeah, there was no other real marketers in the team, I wouldn't say, because everyone else had a different role. Like Joel, Joe, sorry, Joel. Joel is more of a sales guy. Um, he was on the phone all the time trying to close some deals. Um, we had a designer, we had developers, we had, you know, people who ran customer service and support. So there was like a large team, but they were all doing different things for the business outside of marketing. Got it. And when did you make the transition to marketing director and like leading that whole part of the business? Uh, six months into it. So that was kind of the timeline that we figured at the beginning of the relationship. And so we just kind of used that as the, uh, the benchmark or sorry, the milestone, I guess. Okay, so you guys had decided at the beginning that after maybe six months, you would transition to leading that part of the business. Mm -hmm. So were there certain like goals or, you know, achievements you had to hit in order to qualify for that? Or how did that how did that work? Um, I think that was kind of winged. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you. I think we all kind of winged that one. And so there was no like, if this, this and that, then it'll be that. It was more like, all right, are you doing a good job overall? And so we just kind of took it from there. And that's kind of how I'm structuring my apprenticeship for one of my apprentices here in my company, too. It's like I don't have a real milestone um, or achievement that she has to hit in order to be, you know, transition over to a non-apprentice. It's more like, is there value in having this person in this role? And if there is, then, you know, that conversation takes place in, in the sixth month. That makes sense. And how did you figure out how to do Facebook ads for them when it was just starting out? Because that's one area that I find is very hard to learn because you sort of have to burn a lot of money in the beginning to figure it out. So did you already know how to do it from self stairway or did they give you a budget and just sort of free roam to play around? Or how did you how did you develop that skill set? Yeah, they pretty much gave me the budget and I just free roamed it. And so I just did a lot of research, reading, uh, studying and just kind of playing it by ear and seeing what worked and what didn't work. And so I don't think I even took any official paid courses. Probably should have went that route now that I look back. Um, but yeah, I just kind of played around with it and I'm like, oh, hey, this is actually kind of fun. It's really cool. And so once I started my own thing, I deep dove even further and made sure that I understood every single minutia as much as I can. And you know, just kind of kept learning from there. Nice. And what gave you the confidence to drop out of college for this opportunity? Um, not at all, because I didn't even want to go to 
college. Oh. My, you know, I don't know, it might be hard to tell, but I'm Asian. Okay. <laughs> so my, <laughs> my family is very much against the idea of not going to college. I mean, I'd say most families probably are, but even more so if you're Asian, like they want me to be a doctor or a lawyer or, uh, well, pretty much those are my only two options are doctors and lawyers. And so they're like, you know, you have to go to school, finish school, get a degree or whatever, and, you know, do whatever you want later. And so I was like, yeah, that sounds like a horrible plan. Because if I'm going to go to college, I probably should know what I want to do, which I don't know right now. And so I was, that's why I went the community college route is because that way I had to pay a lot of money while still, you know, quote unquote, going to college or whatever and getting a degree. And so I was kind of buying myself time and trying to figure out what do I really actually want to do. And so when I got this opportunity, I was like, well, there we go. Let's just, let's just kind of call it right here then. And so I just told my family, hey, I'm going to disappear for like six months and then uh, I'll, I'll be right back. And then when I got back, they're like, of course, pushing the school or college thing again. And so by then, I already knew that there's no way I'm going back to school. So I just did what anyone would do and just, you know, lie to my family every single time they asked about school. I would just say, I'm, yeah, I'm taking online classes and I'm doing well. And they only just found out, or my mom's side of the family just found out 11 months ago, last December, that I haven't been in school, even though it's been like four years. Jeez. So <laughs> uh, how did they take it when they figured that out? Um, they took it all right. Yeah. Because what I did was I've been building up to it anyway. And so I showed them some of my finances and things like that. And they asked about how my friends from high school were doing. And then when they, when I told them that they were all basically working minimum wage jobs, even though they have the degree and stuff, you know, it kind of made it a lot easier for them to be like, Oh, well, my grandson, you know, seems to be doing okay without a degree. So I guess I'll stop bothering them about school. So fortunately I haven't heard from them about school ever since. Yeah. I find that money is probably the biggest thing that parents want to see to feel more comfortable with it. If you can get any kind of revenue for what else you want to do instead, it just makes such a huge difference in their minds. That's been like a really recurring theme that I've noticed in a lot of these interviews. And it was the same for my parents too, where it was one thing to say like, hey, I want to take time off of school to work on this startup. And it was another thing to say like, hey, we raised some money for this startup and I want to take time off of school. It's a like completely different conversation. Yeah, man. I mean, that's the thing. They're worried about your stability. They want to make sure you're able to take care of yourself. So all this concern and stuff comes from a good place. It comes from like a place of love. And so I try to remind myself of that when I get annoyed of like their their questions and stuff like that. I'm like, ah, oh, stop it. Leave me alone. I'm an adult. But then I got to remember like, okay, it's because they care and like they want to make sure that I'm, I'm taken care of and stuff like that. It's also a weird new world that we all work in now which they definitely did not grow up in when they were our age. So it's probably strange to look at it and to imagine that we can be kind of just as financially secure doing these online businessy things without a big corporation, you know, backing us up with a paycheck. Right. Yeah. There's um, in their eyes, I think, less stability because they're like, well, the, how do you know the paycheck's coming? But when you work for another company, you're also relying on that entrepreneur like keeping their doors open too, uh, which I guess it's minimized if you're working for like a huge company that's been around for like a hundred years. But still, it's like it doesn't mean they're safe. I mean, what if I worked at Circuit City? You know, yeah, <laughs> Circuit City closed down however many years ago, or like Borders, you know, the bookstore that closed probably four or five years ago. So, you know, it's not like you're completely safe either as an employee because you could also get fired for being a a crap employee. Or just get laid off. They decide to downsize one part of the business and lose your job for no fault of your own. Right. Yeah. What about your dad's side of the family? Do they still not know? They've always been supportive. Um, the only people on my dad's side that don't know, I think, are my stepmom and my grandparents. Although now that I think about it, neither of them have asked about school in a while. So maybe somebody clued them in eventually. But my um, dad's always known uh, my uncles and aunts because they're not that much older than me. My aunt's 10 years older. Uh, two of my uncles are four years older than the other two are like somewhere around my dad's age. My dad's like 45 probably. Um, actually younger than that. He had me when, I, when he was like 18 or 19. So, you know, I've always been pretty open and honest with them. Um, it's just my mom's side of the family is a bit more traditional. And so I've had a lie to them, but my dad's side has been in the loop since pretty much the beginning. Were you pretty entrepreneurial in high school too? Like what made you not want to go to college? Um, I wasn't very entrepreneurial in high school. It was more like, 
I didn't know what I wanted to do, and it just happened to be entrepreneurship was something I stumbled upon, I guess, by accident. I mean, I had a buddy of mine in high school that was entrepreneurial and talking about not going to college. He ended up going to college and getting a degree and all that, but uh, he's what piqued my interest in entrepreneurship. So then I started reading about the people that he'd be name dropping and stuff like that. And so that wasn't enough to get me into entrepreneurship yet, but that was enough to make me think maybe, you know, maybe college isn't really a thing for me. And so that's when I started the self stairway thing, which I didn't really view as an entrepreneurial pursuit because self stairway doesn't make money. Like I don't monetize it at all. It's just, you know, a website that cost me like what, 20 bucks in hosting um, every month. So it actually loses me money. So it's probably lost me like 600 bucks to lifetime date. Uh, if you do the math on that for, well, actually, no, it's been four years. So more than that, like almost a thousand bucks, I guess. Um, but you know, that site's what led to everything here. So it's actually a net positive if you give it direct attribution of results, I guess. Yeah, that, that's sort of what I always say about my site too, because it's not really monetized besides some affiliate links and things, but it's led to basically every other opportunity that I've had in the last three years. And so, you know, in some ways you can attribute like everything to it uh, as being that like core foundational piece, especially for what I'm doing now with like this content marketing as a service. It's like having three years of blog content to show some credibility has just been like incredibly valuable. So I feel like, yeah, people discount the value of doing something like uh, one of those sites because they say like, oh, well, how's it going to make money? And you kind of have to realize that, well, it makes money in all of these unexpected divergent ways. Yeah, it's a good way to look at it. Yeah. So what what made you uh, decide to leave Empire Flippers and start Growth Ninja? Um, so there were a few different things. I remember thinking in Bangkok that, you know, I would love to go out to dinner with some of my friends right now, but I just can't afford it. You know, I wasn't getting paid enough to really comfortably go out and just enjoy a uh, fancy dinner whenever I wanted to. Um, also, it was kind of weird being in this conference of like hundreds of entrepreneurs and I'm like one of the few people who's being introduced as an employee. And a lot of people there knew me as the Empire Flippers Apprentice because Empire Flippers has a big name in that community. And so it was kind of like, it was kind of uh, jarring to my ego, I guess, where I'm kind of like, ah, this is so annoying. And so I kind of um, was started thinking about entrepreneurship then because I wanted to be more than just the guy who worked for these guys. And so, you know, it was really cool to be back at that same conference this year um, I've only gone to two of those um, when I was still with EF and this last one. And it was just totally different because now my company has a pretty good name in that community. And it was interesting seeing it from this perspective where I'm coming to the conference as a platinum sponsor. You know, I'm on the main stage for a little bit and I'm giving a breakout session that filled up within like 24 hours when no one else's did. And it was like just kind of cool to have this experience as all right, here's what it was like when I was the apprentice or whatever, or the marketing director and here as, you know, my own uh, founder and kind of catching up with people again, meeting new people who I didn't know. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, you're Vincent. I know you and Growth Ninja. I'm like, oh, wow, this is really cool. <laughs> I didn't expect this, but it's a sweet feeling. What was the conference? Oh, it's from um, Dynamite Circle. Dan and Ian from Choco MBA. They run a, a bunch of conferences, actually, with the flagship being TCBKK in Bangkok. And that's in October of every single year. So I uh, haven't gone to the last several just because it's so far away and stuff like that. And I don't really like travel too much. But this year, I just decided, nah, let's just go and have fun with it. So my employees were there, too. Um, one of them was volunteering, actually, for the event. So she wasn't there repping the company or anything, but brought on one of her other hires, our other new hire. And, you know, she had fun and all that. So what was it like in the beginning with starting off Growth Ninja? Um, I always say that it was a lot easier for me because I already had the network in place from Empire Flippers and things like that. If I had started from scratch with you know no connections, no case studies, really no indication of whether or not I could do the job, that would have been super tough, like finding new clients. And I already had sort of a game plan, I guess. So when I started the business, it was basically just sent out a lot of emails. And so I sent out a ton of emails to pretty much everybody I thought would be a good fit. Um, I did some cold emails as well. And, you know, just kind of took it from there. I just kept bringing on new clients. And after like two months, I think we sent our first invoice. And we actually brought on Empire Flippers, my former bosses, on as my first clients as well. So that was really cool. Nice. 
How did you manage that transition with them? What was it like saying, you know, hey, I'm going to leave and start my own thing? How did you maintain the quality of that relationship? Yeah, so Justin and I actually had a conversation about this uh, shortly before I left Thailand and went back to the U.S. So I said, hey, man, so just to be honest with you, like, I am thinking about starting my own business. I don't know if I will yet or what that'll be, but I just want to give you a heads up that I'm, you know, at least having these thoughts. And so he said, yeah, that's cool, man. But my recommendation as a friend is to keep the job with us and do your thing on the side. That way, you know, you're not cutting off your only source of income, which was good advice. But knowing myself, it's like if I'm doing a side project, that side project's not going to be done at all. So I'm kind of like, all right, I'll think about it. But, you know, I'm not sure. And so fast forward, I think maybe a month or so. Um, it's hard to remember the exact months since it's been a while, I guess. But I think it was about a month later, I made the decision. And so I told them, hey, guys, I'm going to be leaving. Here's what I'm going to be doing. And so what we did was just transition as much as we needed to. So I just created like a Dropbox or something, put us everything in there. And, you know, here are the responsibilities I've been doing lately. Here's how to do them. Um, you know, relatively clean process, I think, at least when I caught up with Joe uh, a month ago, he was saying, yeah, like we were reminiscing and. He was like, yeah, I mean, it was great the way you kind of ended it with us. Like you gave us time, you helped us with the transition. And apparently, I guess I did an okay job with it. Um, I honestly don't remember exactly what I did, but apparently past Vincent did a decent job at it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you started the business and what has it been like for these first two years? You know, how has it grown, bring on employees? Like what's that experience been like? Yeah, it's been fun um, and challenging. And sometimes it makes me think of like, do I want to be an entrepreneur? Like I sometimes I have those thoughts too, because even though it's fun, it's good. It's like, how do I feel personally? Am I happier as an entrepreneur with more money in the bank or was I happier as a 19 year old kid running a self-improvement website? I mean, I don't want to get too philosophical and whatever, but I still don't really know what the answer to that is. You know, every now and then I have thoughts of like becoming a bartender or something like that, which a uh, slight tangent. I had a bunch of my friends over for Friendsgiving this Sunday where I got the chance to test whether or not bartending was my forte. And I could safely say that it's probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. I mean, I was way slow. I was my drinks weren't that great. And yeah, you got to practice. <laughs> Probably weren't great at Facebook ads in the beginning either, right? Practice. I thought you're supposed to just do it and be really good at it from day one. <laughs> yeah. And if you're not, then you just quit, right? <laughs> yeah. You just give up, right? Isn't that the way up. it works? Yeah, exactly. You're either uh, born that's... with the bartending gene or uh, your SOL. All right. What's what's this practice nonsense? I've never heard of. <laughs> I, I definitely get that, uh, that impulse. It's like every now and then I kind of get that feeling of, you know, oh, I could just go to the Virgin Islands and bartend. And like hang out on the beach and write and just be super chill. I can't imagine that I'd ever actually do it, but it is, it's always like interesting to compare that option with the, you know, super driven work hard, I think lifestyle that most of us find ourselves in. Yeah. I think those like fantasies of bartending and stuff like that, it's much better as a fantasy because then you get a, only the perfect image of it. But like what you don't get is the days where you just don't like doing it. Like for example, a lot of my friends would probably love doing what I'm doing right now. But they wouldn't picture like the days where I'm like, do I really want to be doing this? Like, what does Vincent want in life and like getting a lot deep and shit? Like, I don't know how you could even uh, replicate that thought process to something that you've never done before. I can't imagine myself having a bartending existential crisis as I mix a, a vodka cranberry for the fifth time that night. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> I mean? It's just like, oh, sweet vodka cranberry. Here you go. Woo. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> Yeah, you, know, no, like I, you have this idealized version of everything. But of course, reality is never that, you know, but I do love my job. I love my clients. I'm very careful with who I bring on board. And so it is a fun job. But it's just every now and then it's like you have these existential crises that you're kind of like, hmm, grass is greener on the other side and start having these ridiculous visions of like, oh, life could be better. But, you know, it's always your brain making that shit up. It's never going to be as peachy as that image in your head. Yeah, I feel like something that was really helpful for me, I don't remember where I heard it, but sort of related to this was that everything that you do is going to have some shit in it. And so you just have to pick what, you know, shit you're willing to deal with, basically. So it's like this job is going to have its bad parts and that job is going to have its bad parts. But which bad parts are you like most OK with? And maybe you're the same way, but I found that at least with the entrepreneurial stuff, I'd rather have disasters that are my fault and that I control than have these crazy disasters where it's like somebody else 
uh, sort of forcing it on you. Uh, and that's sort of been a helpful framing. It's kind of like with uh, relationships too. It's like every single relationship is going to have its bad parts, right? But like, which stuff are you willing to accept in order to get all the other good parts, right? It's like nothing's perfect. Right. Definitely true. What made you choose to you know, keep the company local versus doing it more remote? Was that you know ever something that you thought about? Because Empire Flippers was remote, right? Yeah, their their whole team is distributed. Um, yeah, that's a good question. It's just easier being able to manage and train someone who's local and like right next to you. And you know, since I don't have a lot of experience teaching a brand new hire and training them and all that. I just figured that adding in the difficulties of a remote team on top of all that is probably not the best idea for the first two hires. And so maybe in the future I could do a more remote distributed approach. But, you know, with hires one and two, it just makes a lot more sense keeping it local. And it's a bit more fun, too. Like we get a goof off in the office and like make each other laugh and stuff as opposed to like just messaging each other on Skype. It's just kind of boring, in my opinion, unless you want to do like calls every single day. Yeah, you lose all that like personal interaction right like if i'm their boss and they have to laugh at every joke i tell them or they're fired i want to see their reaction <laughs> i want to make sure that they're actually <laughs> laughing i don't trust the lol all caps man that, that's yeah, exactly just the, <laughs> the, the joy emoji that's my move <laughs> yeah like i'm good at faking when i'm laughing so i i know when you're trying to do it through text ah <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> and what about this apprentice so you said you're bringing on an apprentice of your own now right what made you decide to do that Oh, she's already been with us for, um, let's see, what is it, November, I think, three or four months now. I lose track of time. Um, but yeah, she's been jumping around in different roles. At first, she was doing funnels, and then she did like uh, messenger funnels as well, Facebook ads, messenger funnels. And then now she's being trained on regular Facebook ads, which is something that I've been resistant to for a long time because I've always wanted to do all the Facebook ads by myself. Um, but now I'm kind of opening up to the idea of having someone help out and like supplement and stuff like that. So having a train on that. How did she find you? So I posted my listing in a lot of different places. And so her boyfriend actually found it on Reddit out of all places. Um, I posted it on this super small local Phoenix subreddit and it only got like 50, 60, whatever views. And, you know, she was like the first applicant too. And so she just turned out to be the strongest one too. Like I had a lot of really strong applicants. And when I narrowed it down to the final two for in-person interviews, it was between her and someone else. And she just came ahead for sure. There was just a very clear decider once I met both people in person. Nice. Do you have any like really good resources for current students who want to find apprenticeships like that? Because it was a big impact on you and now you're offering it. You know, if people are looking for that, do you know where they should go? So uh, the first one is getapprenticeship.com. That's uh, Taylor Pearson's. Are you familiar with this site? Yeah, yeah. Taylor was actually one of the first guests on the show. Oh, nice. So he's like episode two or three, I think. Yeah, so his site is a pretty good place to start. Um, I think there's... Hold on here. I know the DC recently just opened up a little thing to where DC members can post their jobs on there. So jobs.dynamitecircle.com so it's a bunch of people within the dynamite circle who are looking for some sort of hire it doesn't i don't think it has to be like an apprentice per se but you know some of them might be and you could even see sumo in there oh yeah are they posted yeah they it looks like they're hiring oh yeah because i think amon's part of the dynamite circle i think mm-hmm. yep met him in austin back in may great guy yeah amon's great uh I think there's also some remote working sites like uh, We Work Remotely and Remote OK. They have the apprenticeships occasionally. It's more jobs, but I, I think I've seen them there too. It's nice that this is becoming more popular. I feel like it's such a cool opportunity for somebody in school. And uh, in certain fields, it seems like design, development, marketing, it's becoming easier and more popular to offer those. So I feel like for people who are interested in those areas, it's a really cool way to start getting into the industry. Yeah, I mean, if you could get into a job that specifically has a really small team and you can work closely with the founders, like that's how my apprentice was with EF, you learn at a much more accelerated rate than you were in like a large company where you're dealing with managers and like they expect you to already be doing these things that have you find processes and systems. I mean, that's way different from a job where you're sitting at the same dining table at your boss's house every day. You know what I mean? Like I literally lived in Justin's house for like, 
three, four months. And, you know, we would just be sitting at the dining table working. That's great. <laughs> it wasn't like an extravagant office or anything. I'd wake up, go downstairs. And Justin would already be up at his laptop. You mentioned a while ago that there were a few books that you read like late in high school, maybe early in college that gave you a little bit more confidence that you could go down this route. Do you remember what they were? Um, I mean, definitely four hour work week, of course, is the one that everyone talks about. And it's definitely influenced me in some ways, uh, Tim Ferriss. Um, trying to remember what else back in, you said back in high school and college. Yeah. The one, the earlier books that made you feel like, okay, this is a potential career path, not going the traditional college route. Mm. Oh, you're talking about when I saw my buddy who was talking about different things. Yeah. So off my top of my head, he was talking about Tim Ferriss a lot. Ramit Sethi, um, yeah, I think those were the two that he talked about the most. And then from those two, I kind of branched off and started reading uh, like Derek Halpern and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, I don't know if those are resources I would give nowadays, though. No, why not? I don't know. It's just I don't really agree with a lot of what Ramit says. I don't really agree with a lot of what Derek Halpern says. Uh, back then I did. But with the current knowledge I have now... It'd be tougher to give that sort of advice. I mean, I would say check out Tropical MBA podcast. Um, they have a lot of different stuff. They have some stuff about getting started as well, as well as the advanced stuff. And you can even listen to some of my episodes in there. I have two of them. One of them just went up live on there recently again about family. So we actually flesh out the family stuff that we just chatted about briefly earlier. And so Tropical MBA is a good place to start as well. And it's just a good vibe. You know, I like listening to Dan and Ian's uh, style of interviewing as opposed to a lot of the more rigid ones where it's like, here's how you do this with your business. And like he could almost picture their suit and tie behind the microphone <laughs> while Dan and Ian are probably wearing flip flops and like uh, Hawaiian board shorts or something like that. They're hanging out. They're having fun with it. Yeah. Riding a motorcycle. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> while, while doing the interview. Yeah. I was like, what's that yeah. noise? <laughs> Uh, we're coming close to time here. Is there anything else that, that you can think of that you wish you had known back when you were kind of getting started, starting to learn about this early in self stairway, uh, looking for opportunities, uh, either things you wish you'd known or big mental inflection points that happened for you? Yeah. I mean, the big point is just kind of always be open to criticism and feedback and don't be so convinced that you're right. Don't be so sure of yourself because the more I, you know, quote unquote, grow up, the more I realize that there's just so much stuff I don't know. And almost every time where I was like dropping knowledge with like authority and confidence, I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have been so direct and maybe so uh, final about that answer. You know what I mean? So now when it comes to giving advice and stuff like that, I'm a lot more skeptical of myself i'm a lot more cautious i'm a lot it's almost like a lawyer i come out with like a, a disclaimer right before i give the advice like this may or may not apply to you for full details please read the terms of service like um yeah it's just i kind of grown out of the arrogance a bit more i think and hope and i'm not so cocksure of myself anymore so i think that's a that was a good trade back then because if you're too unsure then you just end up doing nothing and if you're cocky about it then you'll just kind of do it because you think you're right but there definitely is a middle ground especially when it comes to working with other people for other people and when other people are working under you you got to be able to approach things a lot less heavy-handed and be more um more fluid with communication I think that's a great note to wrap up on. So Vincent if anybody wants to learn more about you what you're up to where should they go? Truthfully, man, I don't post on the Twitters anymore. So that's probably not the best place. But if you want to follow a dead account, you know, my Twitter is twitter.com slash self stairway. Uh, you can message me on there. I probably won't reply because I don't check it. Uh, GrowthNinja.com is a good one. You can always um, play around with my messenger bots there if you want to steal my automated sequences. But I do get your red messages too. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Nice. Well, we'll be sure to link to all of that in the show notes too, and so people can check out Self Stairway as well and kind of what led into all of this. But yeah, this is a lot of fun. I'm glad we connected. Definitely let me know if you're in New York anytime and we'll keep in touch. You bet, man. And thanks again for having me. Definitely. Thanks, Vincent. All right. See you later. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Nat Chat. 
If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe to Natchat in iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. Second, if you're trying to take advantage of some of the information from this episode, be sure you check out the show notes at nataliason, N-A-T-E-L-I-A-S-O-N dot com slash podcast and find a friend because implementing a lot of this stuff is much easier if you have somebody to do it with. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode and you've been enjoying other episodes of the podcast, please leave it a review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to your casts so that more people can find it. This is the best way for it to get some more exposure and to make sure that I can keep bringing these episodes to you. With that, thank you and have an awesome rest of your day.